Well, it is my honor to have Aaron Fit with us here on our podcast. Aaron, of course, is a, a face and a name you all should know by now if you're a Gamecock baseball fan because he's been covering this team for a variety of entities over the years. But most recently and most prominently, he is a part of the D1 baseball team, and they have become – Gosh, the go-to source in the industry, but I was about to try and put years on it, Aaron, but now I've kind of lost track of how long you guys have been doing the D1 scene. But regardless, you can fill us in, but thanks so much for taking some time and what I know is a very busy period for you here during the NCAA postseason. Yeah, yeah, happy to come on and talk some Gamecock baseball. I think it's been, uh, let's see, I think 2014, 15, that winter was our, our, our launch, our relaunch for, for D1 baseball. And of course, I was at Baseball America for, a decade before that. So I've been covering the Gamecocks a long time now and, and kind of gotten to watch this program. Mo- mostly, you know, mostly have experienced a lot of glory, you know, the first half of my career, um, a little bit less so of, of late. But boy, this team right now, I mean, we're going to talk about it, but this, this team's awfully fun. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting. This team desperately trying to get back to Omaha for the first time since 2012 and playing a team to get there in the Florida Gators who – haven't had that kind of a drought, but I, I guess I also didn't realize their super regional drought was nearly as long as South Carolina's. When the Gamecocks won on Sunday against Campbell, you know, we could roll out the stat first time since 2017 going to a super. Uh, and then the next day, Florida comes from behind in that regional to uh, knock off Texas Tech. And they put that graphic up and said first time since 18. And I, I thought, wow, I don't think I realized it had been yeah. – that long between drinks of water for, for Kevin O'Sullivan's team. But uh, obviously that means both of these bunches are, uh, are thirsting greatly more so even yeah. than normal. For and, this and a, absolutely. And, and it's a great reminder too, just how hard it is. You know, I mean, it's like even Florida has been probably since Kevin O'Sullivan got there, I, I would say Florida has been the most consistently excellent program in college baseball. I mean, it feels like they host just about every year, you know, they're usually um, a top eight, you know, they get, They've gotten to Omaha more than any other program in that span. And even that program hasn't been, you know, to a super since 2018. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy to do, man. It's, it's to sustain that level of, of excellence is the game is more competitive than it's ever been. And, and right now, um, you know, these two programs, it, it feels like are, are, they got a chance here. They got a chance to make a real, a real impact on, on their, their programs moving forward. If they can bust through back to Omaha this year. Both of these teams, I think, most assuredly look like Omaha caliber teams, not just saying, hey, you belong there, but capable of making a run once you get there, that sort of talent. Obviously, only one of them will have that opportunity, and that's not unusual in a super regional setting. Uh, But when they come from the same conference and even the same division, it does make it a little more unique. And these two have some history in terms of postseason baseball, certainly, as well. So you were here this past weekend for the regional, at least for a couple of days. What stood out to you about what you saw from the Gamecocks in handling business the way they did? Well, the thing that jumped out at me was that they looked like the team, you know, that I saw the last time I was in Columbia, which was incidentally when they played Florida um, and, and they swept that series. And at that point, you're thinking, boy, this is this might be the best team in the country. You know, I mean, I, I, that was my impression. I'd seen them, I think, two weeks before against LSU for two games. And then I saw part of that Florida series and I walked away saying, wow, man, like th- these guys might be the best team out there. And uh, and then they weren't for a while, you know, and that's been well documented. They had the injuries and stuff. And then even heading into the postseason and, you know, we knew they were getting healthier. They're getting closer to full strength. Um, but it's still just a matter of, you know, turning that switch back on is, is not just a matter of plugging guys back into a lineup. I mean, you know, you, you, once you kind of lose that mojo, it, it's not that easy sometimes to get it back. And so, hey, I admit it, I was skeptical that they'd be able to do it, um, you know, after the way they had played for the last f- five weeks, really. Lost their last four regular season series and, and one and two in the conference tournament. And uh, But they they kind of pulled the page out of the Ray Tanner book, I think. And, and they'd hit some two-a-days during that time between Hoover and the regional. And they got back to some some real basic fundamental stuff, especially offensively with their approaches. And I guess that was something that was really striking for the couple of days I was in Columbia this weekend was the quality there at bats. You know, I mean, I had looked at uh, the numbers heading into the, the weekend and I was kind of, I was kind of spooked by the, the strikeout totals for this team on the season. I mean, one of the, one of the what five most strikeouts in the country. I mean, it was way up there uh, as, as a, as a team. And, and I was like, wow, you know, I don't, I don't love that. 
part of that is because they work a lot of deep counts, you know, and you're going to have a lot of strikeouts and, and, and a lot of walks. That's just a trade off. And that's okay. You can live with that. But um, I will say that there were a lot of disciplined, mature at bats. There was a lot of this past weekend. There was a lot of using, you know, middle away, that kind of thing. Um, was it nine walks against NC state, seven walks against Campbell. Um, that, that really was, I think a huge factor in this thing. We know they have power, you know, that has been there all year long, but the quality of bats um, and, and the caliber of the defense that they played, those were the things that, that just jumped out at me because uh, that infield now with, with Wimmer back at shortstop and, uh, and Lee Croy back at third and, and Roswell looks great at, at second base. I mean, that infield was, was fantastic. And, and so it kind of feels like now they're back to playing airtight defense and, um, you know, that had been maybe a little bit of a liability before when, when they were missing some parts and now that's back and the at bats are good again. And it, it feels like they're rolling just like that. I, I love what you said about kind of a throwback to the Tanner era, because of course, for folks that don't know so often starting in 2010, when this program would lay its traditional egg in Hoover, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Ray was, he would never acknowledge that he was okay with that, but he would take advantage of the, the extra time back home and really get into some stuff that he felt like the team needed to focus on to be ready uh, in postseason play. And you definitely saw that kind of a vibe and heard that from Mark Kingston, specifically the hitters. I think the arms, it may be more about just getting some rest. But for the hitters, it was, here's some things we need to work on to get back to what we were doing well early in the season. And I, at least from, from my perspective, I think so much of that looked like, uh, as you said, getting guys to buy back in to opposite field approach, using the middle of the field uh, and and not worrying about home runs or pull power. And the heck the wind was blowing in all weekend anyway, for the most yeah. part, but it did, it, it kind of felt like a recipe for success that we had seen previously. And, and it was back and it wasn't reliant on one guy as early in the season, early in conference play, we'll say it seemed right. like so much of it was riding on Ethan Petrie. It really didn't have that feel to it. No, you're right. It was it was really a balance, especially the game against Campbell. I mean, what a tour de force performance that was, really from the top to the bottom. I mean, I thought um, Saturday game, you know, Will McGillis set the tone so well atop the lineup, and and you know, Mark Kingston made that point, like having him back, just again the mature at bats guy who's been around college baseball a long time now, um, having him back at the top does make a huge difference as far as setting the tone. But uh, then on on Sunday, I mean, just all the way up and down the lineup, and Wimmer. We have four hits, I think, um, you know, Messina had, had a few, <laughs> Lee Croy had a few, a bunch of RBIs. I mean, you know, I think they had production one through nine, just about. And, and uh, you know, that was, that was pretty striking, but it, it, it does feel like, um, you know, this offense is back and the, uh, the pitching staff too, it feels like the pieces have fallen into place and we can talk about that, but uh, mm-hmm. the, the lineup piece to me was the, the most important to get those guys back on track. So you, you look ahead to this super regional and everyone knows where Florida's going in terms of pitching. Their their rotation is absolutely set. I don't think there's a whole lot of question about anything. There may be, I guess, to some degree, maybe the order, but I, I would I would think it will go Sproat, Waldrop, Caglione, but I guess we'll wait and see. Carolina, on the other hand, I, I think there's some real questions there as to order and and who's in there because – uh, you know, we were a uh, press conference or at least press opportunity today before they got on the road. And, you know, the question really was, well, what are we doing with Will Sanders? Uh, yeah. He has been so dominant against Florida in his career uh, and and is, and even spoke, of course, to how much he wants to beat Florida after he beat them in the regular season. I think you were there for that press yeah. conference. Um, do you do you, you know, take the bait, if you will, if you're Mark Kingston and give him a start or do you? Look at what he did this past weekend and think that 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 looked pretty valuable, too. Yeah, I was at I think it was a Thursday night game. He pitched against Florida mm-hmm. this year uh, and I was down there for it. And I I wrote about how this is you know, Sanders is back and like it's, it's this is the Sanders that we, we saw in the past. And, we you know, this changes the whole team. Now they're you know, now they're national title team for sure. And, and then it just he, he didn't sustain it. And he's so talented, you know, and we saw a glimpse of it that night. Um and, and it's a great question. I mean, because of the success, the track record he has against the Gators, uh, and because of how great he looked in three innings out of the bullpen against Campbell, do, do you just flip him back in that rotation? My, my, my hunch is this. I kind of like what they found with Hicks in a starting mm-hmm. role. Uh, he just feels so reliable. 
you know, I like that he's a ground ball guy and you're going up against a power hitting team and a power hitting ballpark. Like let's, let's try to, let's try to keep the ball on the ground. Let's, let's roll him out there as a starter. Obviously you're going to start Mahoney. And, and, and I think Sanders just looked, I thought he looked electric out of the bullpen, you know, mm-hmm. let him come out there, rip a bunch of nasty sliders. Um, you know, that way you don't even have to worry as much about establishing the fastball command, which can be an issue at times for him. I mean, the fastball doesn't really miss bats. That's kind of been the knock on yeah. Will Sanders, but boy, his secondary stuff is so good uh, when he's, when he's really commanding it and just let him, you know, take a little bit of pressure off him and just let him come at you. I, I feel like almost keeping him in that bullpen mode kind of plays into, into an attack mentality. You know, and I think that's what he needs. I think he's to stay in attack mode, out of the pen. You know, even if it's just being a slider monster, he can be a real weapon. Um, and maybe you get three innings out of him in a bridge role if you need to. Like we again, we saw him look really, really good for those three innings against Campbell, and we know that you know he can go longer. He has before, uh, so I just think that's kind of a nice luxury. And right now, I think I would ride that hot hand in, in that role. Yeah, and, and you know, I talked to him today about it, and he said warming up during the game coming out of the pen really wasn't that strange to him. He said the strange part was going to the bullpen while the game was going on. He found that to be odd. It's, you know, he's used to having the the quiet solitude of his bullpen session pregame, and then it, that just wasn't really there because because the game was underway. But he made it clear that he had talked to the coaches and said, hey, look, just let me have my normal routine. In other words, I'm not going to warm up quickly. I'm not going to be a typical, you know, bullpen guy who you can just, you know, pick up the phone and say, we need you. He's going to need a plan. So that will be interesting to see how that uh, is all processed and, and where it comes together. But uh, it is a, a unique factor that they have to work with. And uh, and then on the other side, Florida with their, with their arms, the embarrassment of riches that seems like it's there every year. Um, what's your take on, you know, when we saw them earlier this year, it's not that Waldrop or Spro weren't good, but they weren't first round draft pick good and the numbers didn't really indicate that they had been up to that point what what's been there and what can you tell us about what they've been in may and obviously carrying into june has it been trending upward i know caglione's gotten a lot better in that period yeah yeah i think so and again i I saw them against south carolina and then i saw them again a few weeks later against vanderbilt and they look totally different you know, it's like, how, how is this the same team? I mean, they, that got, got swept here and then swept Vanderbilt there. And then, of course, Vanderbilt goes and sweeps through the conference tournament and then loses in a regional. I mean, it's just it was a weird year to figure out the SEC. I'll tell you that. But, um, I, you know, I've, I've seen Sprout and Waldrop and Caglione at their best because I was there. Caglione dealt against against Vandy. Um, on that Sunday, it was really impressive, you know, and, and four pitches from the left side, obviously it's, it's an electric fastball. I think he still had 97 available for him late in the game in like the seventh inning. Um, and that was probably the best he's ever been in his career, but it was good. You know, for him, it's just a matter of, of, of command. I mean, that's, you know, can you trust it? Can you trust the command to be there? And really that's for all three of those guys. That's kind of the issue, but he's a little less established than those other two are. I think Sprout's probably the best strike thrower of the three, but the knock on Sprout is, um, you know, the fastball plays below its velocity. I mean, he'll show you a hundred, he'll show you a lot of 97 to 99, but it's, it's, it's just a light, you know, it's, it's a light 97, if you will. Um, the metrics just don't really, don't really make it miss a lot of bats, but he can miss bats with the changeup. Um, he has developed to his credit because the knock on him was, can he spin the ball? You know, he's okay. developed much better um, kind of slider cutter. I think he calls it a slider as, as well as, you know, breaking ball, more traditional breaking ball that has more power than it used to have. Those pitches have, have improved and it's made him better. And he's the veteran guy um, who, who does compete. He's kind of a low heartbeat guy. He's not a lot of energy there. Um, you know, it, it's not going to be like a fist pump scream in your face guy, uh, but that kind of helps maybe stabilize that team a little bit. And then Waldrop is, is it, he's an energy guy. Um, and I think he's got the best stuff of the bunch. I think the fastball really plays. I think, uh, you know, and it's, again, it's a premier fastball, like a high nineties fastball, but it plays up. Um, and then you've got that splitter. That's a, a, a legit knockout pitch. And, and I, you know, I think he uses two different breaking balls as well, but it's, it's boy, it's, <laughs> it's, it's real stuff. And his walk rate is high. That's the thing for him is just a matter of being a little bit more efficient. I think he has been lately. Uh, I didn't get to see much of him against Vandy because it was one inning and then there was a, a rain delay yeah. because it was Gainesville. And that's what happens. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I get the sense he's been more efficient lately and, and gone deeper and, and kind of peaking at, at the right time for them. So when those three guys are on, I mean, good luck. 
you know, that you, there isn't a more talented trio in the country, and that includes Wake Forest. I think Wake Forest's trio is is better at, at you know, at pitching, at, get, at the business of getting outs, and, and also with very good stuff, mind you. Uh, but, but pure stuff, Florida blows everybody away. <clears throat> yeah, Braylon Wimmer and I were talking today about that, that Waldrop. I call it a fork ball. Uh, I told him, I said, you've probably never heard of Bruce Suter. And he chuckled because he hadn't. Uh, but I said, you know, it's been a while since you've seen anybody that threw a true fork ball. You know, it's not a, I don't think it's a split finger fastball. It's more of a true fork ball. And it is such a unique pitch. And, 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 and Wim pretty much admitted, he goes, yeah, my whole strategy was if it, if it looked like that's what it was, just don't swing. He's, and, and, but then he pointed out Petri, Petri hit one of those out, but that was when Petri was basically unconscious to, to mankind and did crazy things every week. Uh, if you can say you hit Skeen's home uh, fastball and Waldrop's uh, forkball, both were home runs, you're, you are a unicorn, yeah. I have to imagine. <laughs> and, and I think you're right. I mean, I don't know what he calls it. If he calls it a forkball or what he calls it. But like, I looked at the grip, you know, on, on a zoomed in sh- f- uh, photo, and it's, it's you're right. It's definitely not a, a traditional split finger. Maybe that is what a forkball looks like. I don't have a lot of experience judging forkball grips, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, maybe that's what it is, because it's definitely not like your traditional splitter grip. You know, uh, I was looking at the box scores from that series, and a couple things jumped out to me as far as people who were there now who weren't then. Uh, South Carolina had a great weekend, but they were without McGillis, and they were without Lee Croy. And uh, that really adds depth to this lineup. So you'd like to think that that is a bonus for the Gamecocks to get those two guys in there for three straight days in that batting order. And then I looked at Florida and realized – they made a couple of adjustments in their outfield uh, since we saw them that also I, I assume has helped out because when we saw them, Robertson and Evans were starting and now it's Shellnut and it's uh, uh, Shekoffer, I believe is how he says it. And right. I, I haven't looked at all the numbers, but it, it, it seems like they're starting every day now, which I would imagine means they're producing a little more than because they did seem at the time like, Boy, the top four were hell on wheels, but then it fell off in a hurry at that point in the season. And Shelmut's a neat player. He's kind of like that um, for a team that's loaded with big, big name, like premium prospects, these showcase kids, all this stuff. He's kind of that that hard nosed like gamer that, that flies under the radar, but but he's got some ability too. I mean, he can he can really, I think he can really hit. You know, I like his approach. I think he's disciplined. He's a tough out. He goes the other way, uh, and, and there's some sneaky pop in there. So he's kind of hiding down there, you know, seven or eight hole or something, and, and can hurt you a little bit. And I think Sheikover was a, a transfer from, from Rutgers, if I'm not mistaken, um, who had some success earlier in his career and, and then got to, to Gainesville and just kind of got buried. And now he's kind of emerging again, just an interesting X factor guy, you know, at this point in the season. And he's way down there at the bottom of the order, you know, he's not a guy that you're going to circle, but looks like he's been giving him a little bit of a lift lately. He's in the Will McGillis competition for oldest dude in this regional. I think they're both sixth year guys, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, yeah, yeah. interesting where baseball is from that standpoint right now. Okay, so uh, if you look at this series, it, does anything pop out as far as in your gut that you think will be a telling factor, an X factor that will will help make the decision on who ends up in Omaha and who doesn't? Well, I think part of it is, you know, which version of those Florida pitchers are we going to get? Um, because, you know, if those guys are sharp, if they're locked in, they're really tough to beat. But, you know, we've seen it. I mean, it's that's it's kind of one of those things that's just a little bit spooky about the Gators over the course of the season is like, are they going to throw enough strikes at the right time? You know, I mean, yeah. any given week they might, and they might just be dominant, but – then they might not, you know, and, and you just don't, you just don't know. It doesn't feel all that trustworthy. Whereas I will say this, I feel right now a pretty high degree of trust in, in James Hicks and, you know, Mahoney and these guys, and certainly in the South Carolina bullpen. I mean, I think that's an area where, where South Carolina has a real advantage in this series is in the bullpen. Um, I love the, the Gamecock bullpen. I guess one of the best in the country. And especially if Sanders is back there too, it's just one more piece. Um, that has been a bit of a bugaboo at times for Florida is, is mm-hmm. the bullpen. And I, I think it's gotten better here down the stretch, you know, and certainly yeah. the version I saw against Vanderbilt was, was 
was really good in their bullpen now. I mean, in that series, it was it was like, wait, this team has bullpen problems. You know, they, they look great. Like all the guys who were out there were, were were good. They were throwing strikes. I mean, there's depth. There's you know, Ryan Slater is kind of a, a bridge guy and give you some length. You've got Abner with power stuff on the left side. You know, Cade Fisher's a useful piece. It gives you a different look. I mean, it's you know, I, I was impressed with what I saw, but yeah. I would say over the course of the season, that has been a little bit of a question mark for them. So um, it's something to keep an eye on, I would say. Yeah, they don't get out of that regional without Fisher and Slater, yeah. uh, who had to take on starting roles, as you know often happens in these in these regionals, as it gets you know into the odd fourth and fifth games of uh, of a weekend. If you're coming out of that losers bracket, and you know the, the one thing I look at too, and just compiling the, the numbers from that series, South Carolina hit 275 against the Gators, and Florida only hit 198 against Carolina pitching. But just as much of a fact was South Carolina had 24 walks in that series, and, and uh, Florida had 10. And those free, those extra base runners, man, that that really adds up when you're playing a best of three like this is going to be. Great point, and you know we talked about that. How much of a factor that was in in the, in the Columbia Regional, right? Was was all yeah. the the walks that South Carolina drew, um, you know, and 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 if they do that and hit the ball with power, you know, when it's in the zone, I mean, that's the definition of, of good offense, isn't it? I mean, being disciplined and doing damage, both of those things together, that that's that'll get it done. Um, so yeah. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, the ballpark down there plays similarly, you know, I mean, it's, it's a hitter's park. It's a home run friendly park. Uh, both teams, their style of play will be conducive to that place. And it's just a matter of who executes, who pitches better. I mean, um, you know, who defends better. I, I, I would say on paper, you probably would give Florida the edge defensively, but South Carolina defended extremely well this past weekend. They looked again, like a really, really good defensive team. I liked what I saw there. So, um, you know, I, I think I, it feels like Florida is probably the favorite on paper because they're the home team. You know, they, they've mm -hmm. won more games, had the better overall season. And, and, you know, they got a lot of guys who are going to be very high draft picks and big leaguers, but uh, it's all about who's playing the best when it matters the most. How many times have we said that in South Carolina Last week, I mean, the way that they played, I think they could have beaten just about anybody. They, they were a buzzsaw for three straight days. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they if they went down there and, and you know, and, and won that super. It really wouldn't. Yeah, and, and, and that's the funny thing. I mentioned that to someone earlier. So I don't think anyone disagrees that Florida on paper is is going to be viewed as the favorite. And then you stop and go, okay. You know who? How the series go? Oh yeah, that was that was three zero Carolina. That was that wasn't up really up for grabs at any point in time. And uh, and and who played better during the regional? Well, yeah, I'd say the Gamecocks did. So yeah. there are factors that lean both ways. It will. I I I guess I'll say this: I'd be shocked if we're not playing ball on Sunday. I think that, you're that, right. That, too. That'd be the, the real question, I guess. And 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 I'll say this for Florida too. I mean, the fact that they they fell into losers bracket. And then they came back, and then it wasn't like we're squeaking out, we're surviving here, right? From the rest of the weekend, they dominated the next three games: UConn, and then twice against Texas Tech. Those are all one-sided, and those are, as you mentioned, you know, using some guys who aren't maybe usually in your rotation. It didn't matter. I mean, they yeah. just, to me, that was a very, very good sign for Florida. You know, they got hit with a little adversity. All of a sudden, we got to win three straight days. We've already burned our two guys. No problem. I mean, they just, they just really cruised the rest of the weekend. That was very impressive. Yeah, and I think I saw a note where the last time they won a regional out of the loser's bracket, I mean, it was like pre-Sully days. It, it, it has not been the way they typically get and, to the Super Regional. It has been dominance at home and cruise through. And when it doesn't go easily, then it like the last couple of years, it hasn't turned out well for them. And then one other note I saw, apparently they had the same issues – there that we had in Columbia as far as the wind and unexpectedly blowing in all weekend and yeah. may have kept some of the run totals down because that was the one thing that caught my eye. They really didn't have any explosive games, even against Florida A&M. The offense never really broke through like you think that bunch is capable of. So it's a, uh, it's a good point. I mean, it feels like South how it shapes up this weekend when we get down there. So I feel like South Carolina has the hotter offense, you know, and, and Florida, again, they, they pitched very well the rest of that weekend, but uh, yes. as far as hot bats, I mean, you can ride hot bats a long way, especially, you know, in hitter parks. I mean, not, not as much usually in Omaha, you're not going to usually ride hot bats, right. the national title. You got to pitch and play defense. But uh, if, if you're scoring 10 or 12 or 14 runs a game in regional and super, you can sustain that all the way till you get to Omaha. I do think that's something to keep an eye on. Okay, before we let you go, where are you headed this weekend? What uh, what uh, super will you be covering? What's the D1 baseball plan of attack? Uh, I'm going to go down the road to Winston Salem and and, uh, oh, yeah. and watch Wake Forest against Alabama, which I think is a, a pretty good matchup. You know, Alabama's playing 
playing really well right now, of course, and, and house money team, right? They got nothing to lose against the number one team in the country. Uh, we will have coverage from, I think, all eight regionals. We'll have Walter Villa on hand down in Gainesville. He, he's uh, our, our Florida-based writer, great storyteller. Uh, he'll, he'll do a, a fantastic job uh, detailing that series for us at d1baseball.com. Awesome. Well, I think you're going to have a heck of a sight too. I'm with you. I, I think for a one versus 16, yeah. I, I don't think it's nearly as one-sided on paper as you would imagine that scenario would be as great as Wake's been all year. And they have been so consistently good. This Alabama bunch has all the pieces. Uh, there's yeah. no question that they're, they're not just a team that's kind of fluky, got hot at the right time sort of story. It's really more a matter of uh, all the parts that were there have, kind of finally coalesced here in the last month or so, but I, I'm intrigued. I think that that one could be yeah. uh, more competitive than maybe folks might uh, assume from, from a distance. And we thought they might be as high as the number 11 seed. You know, I, I yeah. was actually really surprised to see them down at 16. So I agree with you. I think they're, they're certainly better than their seed and uh, that's fun. It's a fun matchup. And, you know, and, and it's like, it's kind of uh, the natural story here for the number one overall seed. Now, can we get the job done and get to Omaha? Cause two years in a row, you know, Arkansas was by far the best team, had well, at least had the best season by far in 2021 and didn't, you know, didn't get to Omaha. Tennessee the next year, I mean, historically great in the SEC. Very similar season across the board to what Wake has just done. And, and, and Tennessee couldn't get to Omaha. So now it's Wake's turn. Can somebody do it? You know, can somebody follow up that regular season dominance by at least getting to the World Series? So we'll find out. Were you surprised a little, a lot, not at all, that Southern Miss was given that super regional hosting I, opportunity? No, I wasn't surprised. I thought, you know, it seemed like on selection day, Southern Miss was higher in the pecking order. Um, they were like either team 17 or 18. You know, John Cohen said they were maybe one win away. Um, and so, and Tennessee wasn't really in the hosting discussion. I mean, mm -hmm. they were the ninth team in the SEC host pecking order um, pretty clearly, you know, even though there weren't that many wins away either, but right. nonetheless, there were eight SEC teams ahead of them. And so I, I just thought uh, at that point, it, it seemed like Southern Miss was a team that they valued a little higher. And, and frankly, if, if you're looking at the, the quality of the bids, I mean, you can get more people in the, the ballpark at Southern Miss. They draw better. They have a bigger right. stadium. So there's, there's I have not been, I've not been there. How does that park play compared to Lindsey Nelson? Is it bigger? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think every park is bigger than Lindsey Nelson, but uh, <laughs> it's it's also it's also home run friendly for sure, especially okay. right right field. So it's uh yeah, you could see some fireworks out there. Good deal, Aaron. We appreciate your time again. Thanks so much for your coverage of the game and the SEC and the Gamecocks. And uh, I know our our viewers are so happy to get to hear your take on this super regional. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, safe travels to you this weekend. We'll look forward to seeing your coverage from Winston. Derek, enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you.